The rise of veganism on social media relegated it to being merely a fad. Rather than emphasising environmental preservation and animal rights, it became a diet trend that people would join for a few months and then forget. Portrayals of veganism online necessarily alienated those outside the movement when the ex expectations of good veganism became incredibly strict and veganism was always perceived as a legitimate lifestyle choice on our side of the house. We regret its trivialisation. I'm going to do three things in this speech. Firstly, talk about some setup, what we think the counterfactual world looks like. Second, why people, more people buy into veganism. And third, why we improve the quality or like, like buying of the people that actually choose to become vegans in the first place. Moving on to some setup, what do we think a depiction of trendiness actually means? Firstly, we think that something depicted as trendy implies that it is short term or has an expiry date. Because definitionally, if a fashion trend exists, there is necessarily a point where it is no longer trendy and no longer the current norm. Second, we think the way that it is spoken about in conventional media becomes weaponised when it is talked about as trendy. Because it's very easy for Tucker Carlson to get onto Fox News and just depict these people as woke moralists who have simply jumped on to a quick vegan train. No, third, no, no thank you. Thirdly, on general discourse, we, you, on, you don't think that someone has become vegan because of an extensive consideration of morality or a reflection of their life choices. You just think that someone has been influenced by like Instagram, or whatever the general trend of that time is. Fourthly, we tell you that there is now a very, very rigid and very like bi a binary perception of what veganism is under their side of the house. That is to say, the loudest voices within veganism are portrayed as what the movement means because the media has an incentive to pick necessarily the most radical members of this movement when they de define what the trend actually means, because having a trend in the first place necessarily requires a definition of what that trend looks like. That means that you only portray, no thank you, veganism as the most extreme form of what it actually is. What do we think the counterfactual world looks like? Firstly, to the point at which something is depicted in media as trendy, there was already a critical mass of vegans and or already growing exponential group of people opting in in the first place. This mitigates any point that they want to claim about potential growth of the movement from the get-go, because in order for something to be a trend, it already has to have gained popularity and already be mainstream, otherwise it is seen as a fringe movement that no one wants to buy into in the first place. Lots of people is necessarily a prerequisite to something being depicted as trendy to the point in which the media jumps in and starts reporting about something as being trendy. Secondly, we think that the discourse in our world does not depict the people who became vegans in the last 10 years as merely bandwagon moralists. They're depicted as rationally thinking through a life to us. See the fact that something like vegetarianism hasn't necessarily been depicted as trendy. People catching public transport in instead of driving a car to work was not necessarily a trend. These are just life choices that people can rationally think through. We think that's what veganism becomes on our side of the house. What then would veganism look like today? Note the depiction of trendy veganism came about around it came about like around a decade ago. Our diverged counterfactual is likely to be like we think that veganism is likely to be reported on as just another life choice that people have made in responses to the environmental pressures of the 21st century. Being a vegan is no longer frowned upon as an exclusive trend for the privilege. And note that many lifestyle choices that have changed over the last 30 years, like stay-at-home dads, like vegetarianism, have not been depicted as trends, but merely societal evolution. That's what veganism looks like on our side. First substantive point, why people, more people buy in. We don't necessarily expect this to be contested, but why do we care about buy-in to begin with? Firstly, we tell you being vegan is one of the best things that you can actually do for the environment, reducing your carbon footprint. Secondly, this is the unique way to solve the trendy. That is not just waffle. That is to say that you necessarily have a leader that defines what veganism looks like when it is a trend. It looks like vegan teacher on Instagram defining what this means. Fourthly, we tell you that the medium of access is demographically restrictive, which is to say that people become alienated when it's depicted as a trend because a 30-year-old man is unlikely to be swayed by what 13-year-old girls on Instagram tell them veganism means. You necessarily alienate it to the point it becomes a trend. Okay, the second reason why perception is altered is that we tell you counter movements arise from the depiction of trendiness, which is to say the perception that people are just doing it because of the trend discredits the actual goals of the movement. Firstly, it's very easy for a counter movement or like conservatives to easily straw man the goals of this movement when they can just say, oh, you're just another person that's jumped on the train. Secondly, we tell you that news sensationalization occurs because they have a profit incentive to push headlines that about trendiness, not a growing mass of people actually changing their life choices. Comparatively, when it's depicted as something like vegetarianism, which is seen as, as a legitimate life choice rather than a short-lived trend and not one that people buy into because they want seconds or 10 seconds of fame, you don't get the same back. Okay, why then do you make the movement a binary? First, you see a portrayal of a uh, sorry, first, you see a portrayal of a huge list of things that you must buy into in order to be vegan. That is to say this is exclusive to a trendy depiction. Because in order for a trend to be successful, you have to create an ideal of a lifestyle that you must buy into. Trends require definitions of what those trends mean for would-be members. That is to say, under veganism, when it becomes a trend, people try and outcompete each other. This competition is less visible in the world the depiction doesn't arise, that is less likely to alienate people that see this the barriers to 
entry to becoming a vegan as far, far higher when this competition takes place on a public stage. It is more acceptable then to be a flexitarian or a flegan under our side of the house. Maybe you want to be a vegan for like a few days of the week because traininess means that there is only one homogenous perception of what veganism is about. I'll take a point if you have one. We have two responses. Note that vegetarianism is not necessarily a binary, which is to say people can like opt in to the ideals of the vegetarian movement but only be a vegetarian for three days of the week. Insofar as you can prove that makes it far more accessible to the same degree under veganism, that is to say maybe you're only like vegan to like half the extent that you are on like your side of the house, noting that that makes it far more restrictive for the people that are likely to opt in, we can clearly win on scale. Okay, why then do we improve the quality of veganism? Two strands. Firstly, on time. Notice that this is a trend. Buy, in, buy into trends is tied to the time frame of that trend until it is no longer trending. Second, when you become a vegan, it is already seen as something that you give a crack for like a year and then give up because it's no longer trendy. Thirdly, we tell you it's very, very hard to be a vegan. It's the fact that you need to find the right nutrients and iron and protein to stay healthy. When it's depicted as a trend, people just jump on without any preparation of what that looks like. Because after two months when you're sick and malnourished, because every nutrient in your body is malnourished, you're likely to give up. That is to say that leaving veganism is seen to, to be an extremely easy thing to do under their side of the house because I just had my shot at the trend and it's just okay to move on and therefore you don't get long-term buy-in. That is a unique path to victory for us because even if they claim all the benefits they want, they cannot claim in the long term because people don't stick with it. On engagement, firstly, we remove the absolutism of veganism. Maybe you want to do three days a week when the trend is not gate-kept and veganism spends time on less self-policing. Do you eat honey or not? We make it more flexible on our side. This is because it doesn't have to be like one homogenous trend that is defined. Veganism can be what it means to you. On accessibility, we tell you that trendiness increases the ability to fir for firms to charge exorbitant prices. Prices. You weigh this highly because arbitrarily inflated high means that firms can charge exorbitant prices for these products, which gate keeps it to the most privileged groups. This narrows the group that can opt in, but also to the point it's not financially viable to pay $10 extra for every single dish that you eat when you go out on a Friday night. That makes it far more restrictive for you to stay with it in the long term. You should vote for the environment. You should vote for side proposition. <laughs>
and your liver health that it had environmental benefits too. One needed a deep set belief that it was cruel and wrong to eat animals or use them for fur and dairy. Because most people were not raised with this belief, because of the way it was marketed by the movement, was via meat is murder and Peter playing squealing pigs in Times Square. There was very, very little buy-in. It was not a mainstream belief that animals were equal to humans. It was clearly a failing route for veganism spread. The movement turned to the more palatable and more already popular environmental and health trends. It picked up speed there. It became trendy. Trendy. Also, if the health and environmental movements had not taken on veganism on their side of the house, they would have likely turned to other things, e.g. keto getting more dominance in the health sector, plastic straw and zero waste movements having more dominance, the famously unsuccessful ones. Okay, first point on decreased extremism leading to more buy-in, but first I'll take a point if you have one. What incentive does a 30-year-old man have to become a vegan when it's portrayed as a temporary moral as well if you get kept by teenage girls? We think that A, 30 year old men are probably not the group we're talking about. We're probably talking about young people who are already susceptible to trends. But also, the 30 year old man is more likely to listen to a trend, which is like, which his only harm of it is seeing it as trivial, as opposed to someone directly challenging his fundamental moral belief that he's had his whole life by saying that meat is murder like they have on their side of the house. First point in decreased extremism, in fact, leading on from that. There was only exposure when it was not mainstream, was from the most dedicated vegans. This looks like the man preaching animal rights on every corner in your city centre that meet his murder. This looks like excessive protests, like the 2008 streak of McDonald's vandalization by animal activists. Before the vegan movement had the ability to push it as cool and trendy, they used other promotion techniques. The first is shaming. Before veganism was trendy and therefore somewhat normalised on our side of the house, the way vegan tr veganism tried to spread itself was moral shaming. This leads to extreme why? Because often it had graphic images and protests, like pig blood being poured onto the floor of restaurants. This is this was to get it to stick into people's minds as they had less exposure to it under their step um, before the rise, right? But also, veganism recognized that people are necessarily entrenched in their morals and unlikely to change like that 30-year-old man, meaning all attempts to do so pre-trend, they um they thought they had to be extreme. They thought they had to be really in your face. People running protests and activism are also often extreme like that because they, at the point at which they potentially grew up vegan and feel the need to convert people, they want to be extreme. Now, the thing is on our side of the house that we get more buy-in because, because people do not like feeling challenged and shamed in such extreme reigns. They dig their heels into the ground against it. It's also actively upsetting to see yourself blamed for something that you think is morally right. People don't like to feel guilty, and so they disengage with the veganism movement. But it Additionally, this extremism doesn't exist on a scale on their side of the house, so it is harder for people to opt in without going straight to dropping all animal products, meaning they perceive hopelessness and a high barrier to entry. It's worse under their side of the house when veganism is a binary because there's no way for it to happen other than extremism and protesting. The, the second mechanism for this is that the movement is, the, is smaller, and so it's harder to monitor or call out actions when they're too extreme. Why? Because when veganism groups are smaller, they reject all public criticism as more of the same, and now they are critic but on our side of the house they can be criticised by more moderate people within their own movement. This looks like Abby Sharp, a Canadian YouTube vegan dietitian, calling out raw vegans for being nutritionally insufficient, because they got criticism from within their movement, meaning they're more likely to engage with it. We also think in small movements where every single member is extreme, it becomes an echo chamber that gets worse. It seems more important to call out extreme content when it creeps into the mainstream, and on the comparative, when it does become mainstream, the people promoting it are not just hardcore vegans. And on the comparative on our side of the house, the people promoting it are people like Jamie Oliver. It's food influencers, it's people who eat, eat vegan some of the time, who get oat milk because they recognise the health benefits. So content is moderated, it's made by people viewers already trust and watch. And this increases buy-in, which we think is a good thing, like they explained to us so nicely. The secondly is when it is depicted as a trend, it taps into things people already care about, like their health, like being environmentally friendly, eating cultural food, being part of a community, being cool and being trendy. It is good for people to buy into things because other people think it's popular. That is a benefit. By tying veganism to those things rather than shaming or moral messaging, people are more likely to buy in because it shows veganism helps them achieve goals they already care about. It taps into those things rather than a fundamental mental worldview they are unlikely to change. At the end of this point, we have proven that prop gets more dangerous forms of veganism, for example raw vegans who are not able to meet the nutritional needs they care about. Secondly, prop gets much less buy-in into veganism, as it is less palatable, they live in a world with fewer vegans and fewer people who eat vegan some of the time or in some ways. The second point on increased accessibility though, which directly ties into that, and also responds to their material 
about how people don't like a binary, right? So for context, depictions of the popularity of, the, of veganism don't just affect individuals, they also affect broader society like industries. As a characteristic, we think this group beyond anything cares about what is important amongst the public. The depiction of veganism as trendy necessarily demonstrates to society that it was not a fringe idea, that it was not extreme, but an actual area for profit and for development. And what do industries care about, right? We think A, they care about profit, they obviously just like want to increase the amount of money they make. They secondly care about their market share. They want to grow and have the capacity for future growth. And thirdly, they care about innovation. They want to make a name for themselves like Beyond Meat did, right? How has this trend impacted these incentives? Firstly, on demonstrated demand, mass proliferation of people becoming vegan or being vegan and its widespread promotion has led to um, like very, a lot of room for profit development and demand for new products. Secondly, on de demonstrated growth, it has increased popularity of messaging over time, depicting more room for companies to grow their market share. This looks like Fonterra, responsible for 30% of the world's dairy, creating plant-based milk because they saw a demand for it because of the trendiness of vegan veganism. Thirdly, we think it looks like untapped innovation. The above factors demonstrate that there is capacity to make a name for yourself, like the Beyond Burger did. What does that mean? The ex the explosion of accessibility to vegan and alternative food products looks like new industries. It looks like new sectors of markets, like plant-based milks. It looks like, thirdly, greater competition, making vegan products cheaper and more accessible for more people so that it is no longer an elitist thing where you have to pay $10 at a restaurant to get your tofu instead of your beef. It is more cheap. It is more accessible. There is mass general societal support. Things as simple as vegan options in restaurants, vegan re recipe books, vegan bakeries, are all more are all more accessible. We think that's generally a harm. It removes the barrier to entry. Panel, note that after the end of that speech, all of our analysis still stands about why this becomes more exclusive, why this becomes more alienating, more radical, why you are better able to do things like inflate the price of vegan products when it became a trend. All of that analysis stands. Three responsive questions, first on the counterfactual, secondly on who gets more buy-in, finally on like people who are vegan and how they engage with that before a substantive push about benefit to associated movements. First, let's look at the counterfactual because they tell you that like, uh, like ve veganism becoming trendy was about when health movements and environmental movements adopted it. Note that this is not what we tell you and we completely reject the premise that this was when veganism became trendy because you can promote something as being environmentally friendly or being good for your health without it being trendy. Eating vegetables or like eating a balanced diet is not trendy on social media. It's not something I do to be like cool and like be in with the latest fad. I do it because the health movement tells me that it's probably just good for my body and makes me live a healthier, longer life. Note that we do not think the comparison is in our world, people getting pig's blood thrown at them versus it being a cool, like, new fad in their world. The realistic counterfactual we tell you is that in our world it is a legitimate choice that you make. It is the same as when people choose to be vegetarian. No, thank you. Noting that that is not something that is seen as trendy in the way that veganism is seen as trendy versus veganism in the status quo when it is very much like promoted as a trend on social media very much seen within that like kind of fad um 
like depiction. We give you framing at first about how a critical mass of the movement had to grow before it could become a trend for the simple reason that something cannot become a trend if there is no one who partakes in it. That is the literal definition of a trend. They need to engage with all of the analysis we give you as to why that is the realistic counterfactual. Note at the end of this point that a lot of their responses and a lot of their material now falls down because all of it relies on this idea of veganism in our world being this super alienating thing where you're walking up and like screaming to people that meat is murder that is not what the counterfactual looks like that means that their buy-in like point comparatively does not gain them any ground let's look at what they tell you about buy-in because the only time that they actually engage with what we tell you about is in response to a POI where they tell you that oh well it's only young people who are influenced by the trend you're unlikely to capture like the 30 year old male who doesn't want to be associated with their trend yes that is correct in their world, the 30-year-old male is never going to buy into that because they feel alienated by the trend, because they do not want to associate with that trend. In our world, where it is seen as a legitimate choice, where it is something where you can choose to opt in for that for your own individual reasons, where it is not seen as jumping on like the latest fad, like a bandwagon, you are more likely to get those people to join, you are more likely to get those people to engage with veganism. It means that even if they do not become a complete vegan, they were more likely to still engage with eating vegan some of the time, choosing a vegan option when they could, because it wasn't alienating, because it wasn't radical, because we give you all of this analysis, no thank you, about how in their world it is seen as a binary at the point at which the trend promotes the like ideal idea of like what it means to be vegan or buying into our lifestyle, then do not engage with that. That means that we get more people making vegan options some of the time who are never going to be full vegan in either. The world. But let's look at the people who do engage with the vegan movement. Let me tell you a couple of things. The first is know that we just think in their world you often delegitimize these people's choices because you trivial, trivialize it, right? It's the idea that people make fun of vegans because, oh, you know someone's a vegan because they'll tell you every five minutes, right? That is incredibly devaluing when you engage, when you were a vegan and you had legitimate reasons for engaging with that. But secondly, we just tell you you get more vegan options in our world and we tell you that these options are probably better, right? No, this is directly a responsive to their push about like firms offering more uh, like vegan food options etc. Notice that large amounts of like non-Western food are often known as like accidentally vegan, but these are not things that are popularized as trendy in the status quo, because especially in the developed world, especially in social me media algorithms, they are not seen as trendy. They are not the things that go viral. They are not the things that people appreciate as like cool or the latest fad. We think that in our world, they become more valid, more well-known options for vegans. I'll take you in a moment. That looks like people turning to healthier, better alternatives for protein, because instead of promoting peanut butter as a good protein source, which by the way, it just is a very bad protein source, like objectively, you now turn to things like Satan, where you like, were able to get like more protein from flour, things like that, things like healthier alternatives like that, go ahead. The problem you have is that vegan food was a radical part of the world prior to its globalization to trend. How would you, in your counterfactual, convince that same 30 year old man to take part in this radical part? Because I tell you explicitly in the counterfactual point that we don't have to stand by vegans being like this super radical niche subset of society. That something can be like fairly normalized and not be trendy. That there are a lot of things in society that like are not radical, that are not and that also are not trendy, that realistically this looks like like people uh, like this looks like people's perceptions of like vegetarianism. We tell you that the mass grows before it becomes trendy. That is the counterfactual that this debate occurs in. But then also they bring you this point about price, right? Note that firstly, the entire mechanism for why price like decreases in their world is reliant on them getting more buy-in, which means that if we can prove that they do not get the buy-in that they say they do, or we get comparatively more, we are able to take that mechanism. But secondly, we tell you it is uniquely worse regardless of buy-in when it was a trend because you were able to artificially inflate the price because you were able to charge a dollar for oat milk when people would buy it anyway because it was seen as trendy because you were able to charge so much more for things like Beyond Meat when it was seen as like the latest fad. They tell you about how it's really bad for people's health because they engage with things like being a raw vegan when that's like doesn't nutritionally sustain you. Notice that that's the status quo, like people becoming raw vegans and not being able to access the 
like nutrients that they needed to came because it was a trend, because it wasn't pushed as a legitimate choice where you needed to think about the health aspect of this choice as well. You just bought into it because it was the latest trend that you wanted to jump on. So moving on to my substantive push about why we benefit associated movements. Note that veganism has become incredibly associated with movements like the animal rights movement or the environmentalist movement. This is because we think that often the underlying reason is like quite similar in that you're trying to help the environment, you're trying to help animal rights, things like that. Uh, but like we think the growth and like general perception of these movements, um, like be, the like improvement of the growth and perception of these movements is a generally good thing because they are trying to achieve good outcomes in the status quo. They're trying to do things like end animal suffering or like benefits to climate change. The issue is in their world, you trivialize these associated movements when they are painted with the same brush because when they are still when they are associated in their world with the fad of being vegan, when they are seen as superficial, it delegitimizes the people who do buy into the environmental or the animal rights movement because you are seen as more radical because when you are part of the large group of people in the environmental movement who weren't necessarily like a hardcore vegan who wanted to buy into like a zero waste lifestyle you were still painted with that brush it made it harder for you to legitimately convince people to buy into the movement it made it harder for you to like spread that message because you were seen as more radical in our world it's seen as more of a legitimate choice when you became vegan it was seen that you had a genuine care about the environment environmental movement or like the animal rights movement that this was a choice that you had made for your own individual reasons not just because it was a trend on social media this meant that it was less alienating that people were more open to having conversations that this trend wasn't weaponized against those movements and we got benefits there as well we were able to benefit those people who did engage with vegans we got more buy-in we benefited associated movements It is entirely unclear how proposition thinks that people are going to find out how to be vegan, are going to understand what it's like to be vegan, are going to understand the benefits of veganism when it is not trendy, when it is not in the mainstream, and when it is siloized. A few things to do for you in the speech today. Firstly, talk about what is a trend and what does that mean. Secondly, talk to you about accessibility. And thirdly, tie all of those first two points together to show how we get more buy-in. So let's look firstly then at what is a trend. How does a trend develop? Because it's not like we just wake up one morning and suddenly our TikTok page is filled with veganism is great. Slowly, a few court like vegans start to try and bring it into the mainstream and make it look cool. People start to slowly buy into it and then you reach this critical mass that makes it trendy. Note that if you don't get people starting to depict it as trendy, note the thing that this debate is actually about, the regretting the depiction of veganism as trendy. If you don't get these initial people depicting it as trendy, you're never able to gain that critical mass that they talk about that leads to it then becoming trendy. The, this, this means that the change in this debate is the hardcore vegan movement that was already on social media, already contacting media organisations, already writing cookbooks, changing the way that they market their material, changing the way that they do their promotion from what was previously a very moralised shaming stance to 
two-edged stance that ties it to things that are cool. Because I think we can all agree that a trend is about something being cool and popular. How do you make something that is just a diet look cool and popular? You tie it to other things that are already cool and popular. That is if we're talking about teenage girls being healthy. That is if we're talking about university students who care about the environment being environmentally friendly. Because those are things that are in the status quo perceived as cool. It is also tying it to being aesthetic, like making lots of pretty food. It is tying it to being really flavoursome and interesting. It is tying it to cultural foods that in some areas already look and seem cool. That means that you so that means that the hardcore vegans change their twists from promoting it as a moral thing to promoting it as something that is cool. That allows them to start building up buy-in from the, the mainstream, which are including things like mainstream media, but also just people on TikTok, also just mainstream content creators that previously weren't vegan picking it up because of this new marketing and that allows us to reach that critical mass that makes it a trend. This leads to more content creators and media jumping on board because it is a way to get views and clicks and to make money. Note then at that point we get a variety of perspectives. They claim that a trend necessarily is homogenous but it's not true because at the point at which you get all of these groups, other content creators, other media organisations, other cookbook writers, other vegans getting on board because they see that it is cool and they see it as a way to get clicks and views, they need to show a unique perspective in order to stand out. But they also just have a unique lived experience of veganism or of food in general, which means that they show a different side of it. That means that you don't get this homogenous vision because you get other people coming in and competing to be the ones that are best able to capitalise on the trend by providing a unique perspective. That is things like showing people using more like fruit and veg based diets, people using more flexitarian vegan diets, people using more diets that are based around protein for becoming an athlete, people doing diets that are more based around being vegan when you're pregnant because people are all trying to bring the unique perspective to capitalise on this trend. That is what something becoming a trend looks like. And the last thing to note is that they say that trends are necessarily short termists. We don't think this is necessarily true. We think the overall trend of veganism has stayed trendy. What has allowed it to stay trendy is that it changes and evolves. There is a different trend every day, there is a different trend every week of what is cool about being vegan. That means one week highlighting how you can still get B12 in a vegan diet, or another week highlighting lots of cool tofu dishes, or another week talking about how athletes can still be vegan. These are the things that are the short term trends within the overall broader trend of veganism being cool and trendy. That means that, that most of their claims about what this trend looks like does not stand, and that means that most of their material about how they decrease buy-in doesn't stand. But I'll touch more on buy-in in a second. Let's talk secondly then about accessibility. But before that, I'll take your point. There is a very clear distinction between promoting the genuine benefits of something and making something a trend just because it's cool and you should do it. Okay, one, why do you think that something is cool? Often because you think that it brings you benefits, right? Often because you think that it makes you a part of a group. But secondly, unclear why that's a harm, given that the broader aim of this debate is to increase buy-in. Not, but at the point at which we make veganism seem cool, people try it, people get into it, it becomes a part of their lives. Even if they're not a hardcore vegan, it means that they now see recipes that allow them to eat less meat. It means that they now are used to going and buying tofu or have actually tried tofu, which means that even if we don't necessarily get um, everyone being a vegan, we normalise veganism, which lowers the barrier of access for people to get into it. No, Normalisation is what they supported on their side, unclear how they're going to achieve it without this trend and with veganism still being siloised. Let's talk secondly then about accessibility. Their claim on accessibility is that you make things more expensive when it is a trend. The first thing to note is that it's unclear why a lot of vegan products are being provided in the first place, at the point at which it isn't something that most people are. Not that we've explained to you, or, or it isn't something that makes your business look good. Not just something being trendy in and of itself. Makes businesses want to make products for it because they want to be able to advertise themselves, capitalising on the idea of this trend. That means that you get businesses creating vegan products which you couldn't get in the first place. So even if they're expensive because a lot of people want to buy them, accessibility has still increased a lot more. But secondarily, we gave you a mechanism that countered this, which is to say that when lots more businesses are making it, there is more competition, which means to stand out, you lower your price, which means that you get cheaper products and you get One veganism invasion. being more accessible overall. But they also have responded to our other unique mechanisms as to how veganism is more accessible. That you just get more 
more content about how to be vegan. There's more content on how to be vegan in a healthy way. There's more content on how to just simply cook vegan food. That means that the barrier of entry is lower because you don't have to go and search it out as much. When you open your social media page, there is some vegan videos. When you go online to BuzzFeed, there are vegan recipes. When you go and watch the TV, Jamie Oliver is cooking a vegan dish. That means that it is just substantially easier for you to be vegan. No, thank you, because there is more information about how to do it. Given that, then, why do we get more buy-in? Firstly, because I've explained to you that when something becomes a trend, becomes more mainstream, we get less of this extreme veganism. Because people have changed their marketing from using moral shaming that they didn't like to using promoting something as cool. But also because more people are involved. People that you trust, like Jamie Oliver, are now making vegan content. You're more likely to buy into their content because you already trust them. You're also more likely to buy into their content because they're being less extreme and more moderated. As we proved to you at first, given I've just proved the characterization of trendiness, and that was the only way they responded to our first argument on buy-in, all the mix we brought you at Teresa still stand. But additionally, given that we have proved greater accessibility in this debate, we are able to prove that it is just easier for people to become vegan on our side of the house. Not as a few people become vegan, even if it is just young people, this spreads out through society. Because you, as a 30-year-old man, when your daughter is vegan, she is now cooking vegan food in your home. You try it one night and you think, huh. Actually, that's not so bad. Suddenly, your neighbour is vegan and you see them drinking their vegan juice and you think, huh, that's interesting. I could be vegan too or I could try that as well. That means that slowly we get the normalisation they want. They need to prove to us they get normalisation while it's still siloized as an extreme movement. <laughs> Trends can discriminate. This team unfortunately conflates visibility with access. That's to say the burden on this team is to defend the status quo. A status quo where unfortunately, if they want to defend this trend, the majority of people, overwhelmingly, are not vegan. A trend that has failed because it has been branded as something that was exclusive to a subsect of society, one that they bought into for weeks, for maybe months, before dropping out because all they wanted to do was ride a short few weeks or months of popularity. That was the world they had to defend. They have to explain why the status quo they're getting anywhere near normalization. If that's the burden they want to push on us, I think it is more likely in our counterfactual. A few things I will do in this speech. Firstly, on what are the actual two worlds that each side is defending in this debate. Secondly, on who gets more buy-in and thirdly, who gets better buy-in. Firstly, on what are the two worlds we are defending? The reason I start here is because almost all of their case is predicated on the assumption that in the absence of this trend, we must support an extremely toxic and, you know, uh, extreme version of veganism. The first question I want to ask is just to decide with what they have to defend, which is what do trends look like? We give you a host of reasons at first that largely you don't get enough sufficient response. The fact that it is largely short-term, it is trivialized, it is exclusive, that people have an incentive to outcompete each other to be the best at being a vegan, which alienates people who are not able to buy into that, that is controlled and, pro and propagated exclusively on social media. If they want to stand by things like cookbooks, yeah, maybe that still exists, but obviously over Overwhelmingly, the trendiness of this is, de is developed on social media. That's where you can do things like go viral. Cookbooks don't go viral. They can't run away with TV shows and things like that. 
I think that's why we say people are locked out and that they buy in less. What responses do we actually hear to what these trends look like? The first thing they say is now, no, you're the one that has to defend extremism, people throwing blood on each other. Panel, I think in both worlds it is symmetric that this counter movement in terms of being really toxic about extreme, like, you know, showing videos of like chicks dying exists. Uniquely, what is the difference between these two worlds then? Is that on our side, we do not give these people who oppose the movement another narrative, which is that you are trivial, that your choice is not legitimate, that you're buying into something just for a few seconds of fame. That is an exclusive narrative that, that can be pushed on their side, that is why there are now more mechanisms that are stopping people from becoming vegan. That is why we don't think trends are particularly good. And that's all the framing we give you about how trends just be, trends do not necessarily mean that they're open to everyone. Being trendy is because you're exclusive. That's the framing we give you from first. It does not, not, not get enough response. If everyone does something, it is not a trend. That's why trends don't equal normalization. The second response they give you is to homogeneity. They said people can have their own unique voices and that the trend of, ve like the trend of veganism doesn't necessarily have to be one thing. I think we already outframed this from first because obviously you have an incentive to outcompete to the person who capitalizes on that trend the most. That's to say, the pe reason people join trend, as they can see down the entire bench, is people want to be cool. That says that people want to maximize how cool they can become on their side. The way you do that is by being the best vegan, being the loudest vegan, propagating your idea, saying that this is the best form of veganism you should adopt. That's why even if people have different perceptions of what veganism was, it was locked out under their side because you weren't able to outcompete with the strongest voices that already dominated the narrative. That's why people who even joined were likely to leave, but we don't think people are going to join in the first world. Second question then under this is what is our kind of factual have to respond. They've tried to say, oh, before, like now what they get to defend is now people capitalize on environment and health. I think we already wrote about this at second. Like obviously we can point to the fact that now eating vegetables is eating vegetables is good for you. They had to say, oh no, people had to be told it was cool for you. Panel, this is ridiculous. Is it cool and trendy to be healthy, to care about your body? Obviously not. We think we are the side that can defend education, telling people they are making a legitimate choice that is good for you. They can't cop things like health and environment. Look at vegetarianism. That obviously was not something that was trendy, but people told them that it was good for the environment that was good for you, that is what we can defend. I don't, and the second clash on what is the counterfactual is this thing about the critical mass. And they just try to say, oh, it is the depiction of trends that led to the critical mass. Obviously, this is a timeline problem. How can you say something is trendy if there is no critical mass to begin with? Like, maybe someone could just go out and put a news headline that says, ah, I don't know, like some really niche form of veganism is trendy right now, but no one's going to buy into that trend if it does not have people around them that are already trying to buy in. That's to say, maybe they get the depictions on their side, but if they wanted to buy in, that was crucial and that was critical on the critical mass existing in the first place, so it's unclear why the critical mass actually was why the critical mass came after depictions. Obviously, it was the other way round. What are the two things we explain then? Firstly, we so therefore at the end of this, I think mean the counterfactual is the one we point to. The fact that it is something like vegetarianism, that there was already a critical mass, a trajectory that was going upwards, that was how we got normalization. Because people made legitimate choices. But secondly, as I explained later in the speech, we don't think we have to support being, people being fully vegan. A lot of our benefits can scale. That's to say people make, you know, some change to their lifestyle. Maybe they adopt a vegan diet but not a full vegan lifestyle, or maybe they do three days a week of veganism. That is still a huge benefit for us. So it's unclear why normalization has to be this full hardline thing they want to support. In fact, I think that's what the trends they propagate say. First question of clash then on who gets more buy-in. We explain two key mechanisms that really don't get enough response. Firstly, the fact that now there is no binary at the point which you can scale how much you want to do. That's to say that when there is no trend that outcompetes each other, no thank you, and propagates an exclu exclusive narrative of what veganism is, people can now make decisions as to how much they want to become a vegan. And the reason this is important, panel, is because veganism is an extremely hard choice to make, it's an extremely hard change to your lifestyle as they concede. Which is why, if we think we can let people scale into that, I think that is a benefit for us. Because obviously if people eat just like 50% less meat as opposed to 100% less meat, or wear 50% less clothes made with cows, that is a massive benefit for us. But secondly, you are not tarnished by the same brush. That's to say that conservative media weaponized the narrative that you were not making a legitimate choice, you just wanted to ride two seconds of fame. You were not tarnished by the same brush, even if that was not what you actually wanted to do. So I think we got more buy-in there. Final thing I'm going to do here under this a clash of who gets more buy-in is that I think we can co-opt all of the mechanisms I explained about how the good for health thing, etc. Because they had to support the fact that under our side, education, like it is a surge in this debate that for some reason it was education about caring for your body came after the moralism extremism thing. Obviously for decades, we've been told that vegetables are good for you, eat your vegetables. It is unclear why this came after the moralistic thing about animals. I think there was another timeline problem there. So even if you buy this thing on, you know, good for you in education, I think we can that. Final thing I want, next clash then, which I think is more important, is like who gets better buy-in. This is taking them at their very best, assuming they get symmetric numbers of buy-in. They wanted to buy this thing on like Jamie Oliver and doing his show. But I think that there are two, 
I think there are two few responses to this. Firstly, I want to deal with this concept of innovation. We respond at second when we explain that somehow the trendy vegan foods are the only ones that people popularise, whereas other things like satin are not. And panel, don't think this is a good response. Plant-based foods currently are horrible. And the reason why is because people had to rush to keep up with the trend, which is why when you developed plant-based meats, they were extremely processed. There were things like carcinogens in them that people didn't do because they were not growing with sustainably at a slow and reasonable pace. They had to support a sharp rise, which gave companies incentive to fast-track the process, make options that were vegan, but not necessarily good for you and healthy. Second thing is that on prices, I think that we explain convincingly why prices are likely to lock people out onto their side. I'll take you in a second. That is firstly because if it is more popular, people are likely to buy it. That is to say the demand is largely inelastic during this peak sense of trends, so people can companies can up price and people still buy them. But secondly, a new response. To the extent we already show that trends do not last forever, you as a company have a direct incentive to up price because you want to make the most profit while the trend is at its peak before it goes down. That is why you outprice people, sure. It's unclear why people can't be vegan three, day, three days a week on our side. Is it not worse when the loudest voices are Peter activists as opposed to influencers on our side? We already explained why Peter activists exist on both sides, but you give now those people another narrative which is saying that you are not making a legitimate choice. People can't be vegan ideals like just for three days a week because if you were lying on a trend that was exclusive, you have to buy into it fully. People didn't choose to buy in at all. Second claim they have here on innovation is somehow that now there is now competition, so companies will lower their prices. I think this is the best material. But the problem here is that obviously in the status quo, the majority and over majority of people just are not vegan. So very limited companies have an actual incentive to enter the market. We think those that do probably are not the better or there is not a large amount of competition between these companies. But second, there's probably a first mover advantage, which is to say, if you can develop your product the first, you can probably outprice before other people start competing with you. But again, that can see that mechanism as to how this develops unsustainably. Final thing I want to do here is on the thing of accessibility on people, you know, seeing their recipes live. At their best, I'm willing to concede maybe Jamie Oliver doesn't do a vegan cook show. Why is there not enough for them to win this debate? Firstly, because I think that people on the both sides of the house who are not joining veganism just because it is a trend still exist. That is the people who actually care about veganism and expanding the message. Those are the people who still put their recipes on BuzzFeed and online for the media to access. But secondly, we reach people through far better mechanisms. That is, we do things like educate kids in school because it's good for your health and it's good for you, as opposed to lying to people believing it is cool. That is where we get people to be because we tell them to believe in the science, not just to rise in two seconds of fame. At the end of this debate, we got more buying. But even if we didn't, their buy-in was never long enough because people left it after it was too hard or after the fad died. For all those reasons, support so, support side proposition. Veganism today does have its fair share of criticism. It has the fringe Tucker Carlson's railing about how you should be a meatitarian to combat the woke left. It has the people who only become vegan for a week and then quit. But what it also has is the greatest adoption of veganism in history. It is the most products about that uh, plant-based and uh, plant dairy alternatives in history. It is the greatest explosion of vegan offering and alternative diets in history. That is the world that's been created when something like veganism is depicted as trendy, when it's depicted as necessarily popular as we gave you at first. And that is the problem that proposition never contends with. Their only response is to say that a critical mass already existed and in the counterfactual, it would have risen anyway. But it was never clear how that happened. It means they can't win this debate. Three questions. The first is on the counterfactual, second on characterization and buy-in, and finally on accessibility. First and on counterfactual. I want to strategically note here that the key 
the problem with opposition case is that they never prove why it is true that they still uh, that they don't have to stand for a radical form of veganism. Because they simply say that they don't have to stand for it, right? They say it can still be normalized even in the absence of, uh, of, of the trend. But they never prove this, except to say that a critical mass would already have existed. No, it wouldn't have, because we gave you clear mechanization about why in the alternative world, prior to becoming mainstream and trendy, veganism did look like things like Peter activists and of railing about the death of animals. It did look like a fringe, small group of people prioritizing a radical shift from the norm. Because that is the characterization we gave you and that was agreed upon by proposition. That this was a big change from the norm and diets at the time, meaning that there was necessarily at the start only a fringe group that, that, that did it. And the key mechanization and the important thing that the proposition misses is not that Peter activists exist on both sides, that in the counterfactual they are the dominant group. It's that they are the group that primarily exists. Why is this? We gave you a first and reasons that firstly, simply smaller movement means you're less likely to call out extremist actions uh, because there's less capacity to do so. And secondly, uh, that hardcore vegans are the dominant group and therefore promote their idea. They never, they never characterize why in their counterfactual they think it would become mainstream because what we told you was the mainstream was the result of a few vegans at second deciding that they wanted to make it less fringe, less extremist. They never contested this. What this means is their counterfactual does exist in a world where the alternative was simply less vegan or more extremist veganism. And that is something they had to actually contend with as opposed to just saying they don't have to stand for it. It's true that they may not necessarily have to stand for it, but they don't give us reasons why that is the most likely counterfactual. We give you reasons explicitly through, the, uh, through all three speakers about why that is most likely counterfactual. We think that therefore that is the counterfactual. They also say that uh, in the alternative you would make a decision for yourself or your own individual reasons. But again, this doesn't address the core problem, which is that they never prove that you can have the capacity to do this. Because when they talk about the 30 year old man who is reluctant to become vegan in the status quo, they are far less likely to in a world where it's fringe and extremist and counterfactual stance. But second then, let's tie this into characterization of the current movement and buy-in. And I think this is where a significant portion of the debate takes place. Look, I think that both sides agree that buy-in is important. But what proposition attempts to do is say that the status quote has no buy-in or very little buy-in. At the very top, I want to reject that that is even true. Because if you look into society now, it is the largest growth of vegan products in history. And only now have we ever prioritized even having things like plant-based alternatives for individuals. We told you that was important both for the accessibility and buy-in of veganism, but also for other groups as well. It means that the trend and depiction of vegan as popular meant that it was seen as something that was mainstream and normalized, that allowed people to actually buy into something that was relatively common. We also told you that it makes a more accessible, which I'll go into later, I was relatively wrong just wanted to down proposition bench. But therefore, the premise that they give us that veganism is not popular now is untrue. What are the actual mechanisms they give us for why uh, the current buy-in is bad then? The first thing they try to tell us is that it's extremely prescri prescriptive because you can't escape the competitive dominance of the top veganists. First of all, I'm not sure what they think the trend of veganism looks like because there's no veganism HQ on t TikTok that pushes one narrative. It is literally as we gave you, every single person who participates in the trend having different notions of what that looks like. And maybe that does look like for some people being vegan one day a week like a meat-free Monday because that is the sort of thing that is less prescriptive that is allowed when you allow a broad perspective of people to have their own narrative. Second, I think this is deeply uncomparative because in their counterfactual about making a decision for your own, then you are necessarily making a more broad decision about whether to be vegan or to not be vegan, right? Which you have to buy in more necessarily to the uh, more rigid structures of just not eating any dairy products or meat products whatsoever to call yourself a vegan. Comparatively, when it's a trend, we think you can opt into these things that they want to tell us so much is good, like having alternatives, like being vegan for one day a week. They do the impacting for us, but we flip this to say we get this more at the point of a broader and more diverse group of people being able to, pro uh, to prioritize this. The second thing they try to tell us is that you trivialize it, that people become vegan for a week and they give up and the 30 year old is reluctant to change because they think it's just a woke liberal or some teenage girl thing to do. The first thing we want to say is that at the very top, we think it's better if it's trivialized relative still to being extremist. That is the comparative that exists. We think that even on that, trivialization is better than that because extremism turns people even more away than trivialization because at least people try it when it's trivial. But second, we don't necessarily think it's true that it's trivialized because even though some people like Tucker Carlson rail against it, we think that is absolutely symmetric in both worlds because those conservatives that they want to talk about are the most extreme conservatives. And if they are hinging their case on those people not wanting to be vegan, then I don't think 
anyone will ever be vegan in the world because those people don't seem to really want to change whatsoever. Those are people bought out, for instance, by the meat industry. Those are people who rail for going back to the great old days. We don't think they are very open to change. That means that it is about the broad majority of people, say teenagers on TikTok or broader society. We think that the trivialization has also come the great explosion of different options. As both sides agree, options are fine and we don't want rigid veganism necessarily. It means that we get more by it. At the end of this point then, I want to note two things. The first is that we absolutely have proven greater buy-in at the point the trend means you can attach to things like health movements, environmental movements that aren't as extremist as before. But second, that proposition doesn't provide any unique reasons for why they are better on this, only attempts to mitigate. That means they don't have a path to victory, only a path to mitigation. They fail to even do that. I'll take that point. The idea that vegans made it mainstream is predicated on the assumption that social movements have control over their depictions in discourse, whom we've argued has created a superficial depiction. Why are vegans self-identifying as cool, the tipping point where veganism goes mainstream? because people say they're vegan, because people adopt vegan practices, because that leads to companies doing things like creating vegan alternatives. It is literally about perceptions, right? And that is what makes things mainstream. If people say they're vegan and act vegan, then they are vegan as far as we are concerned, and that gets more people to buy in. I'm not sure what that point does. Finally then, on accessibility. I want to really bring this, uh, I want to bring this up to you because of the fact that proposition starts to ignore this down the bench. When we gave you at first and whipped at second how important accessibility of products was to veganism and to broader diet alternatives because the only response we get from them is to say that very little people are vegan and therefore companies uh, don't don't create innovation and secondly you're able to inflate the prices we think these are both just really weak responses right because what we told you was that the depiction of vegan being popular means that companies are incentivized to create products we gave you examples like Beyond Meat and a Fonterra dairy alternatives empirically we also gave you structural reasons like wanting more profit wanting market share wanting innovation that only happens when you see there is a growing base of people that was the comparative we gave you. Because when it's trendy, it's, it's perceived as growing and that's when companies get involved. The impacts of this at first were that not only is veganism more easily accessible because there's more of it, prices get lower because there's more competition. We don't think inflating prices is sufficient to deal with literal market mechanisms. And what that finally means is that it's easier to be vegan and it's easier for people adjacent to being vegan, like vegetarian, like having other diets, to adopt alternatives. This debate was about who gets more people to be vegan or vegan adjacent. We do that by making it normalized and accessible so proud to oppose. I think that's bigger than that final speech. Now welcome up the opposition replies to include the entirety of the opposition bench. Here, here. has been quite funny because proposition is basically playing at opposition, producing a very defensive case, explaining why we don't get benefits. They literally never proved that they would. That means we don't have to prove that everybody becomes vegan or even that a very large number of people become vegan, just that a few more people become vegan than previously would have. A few things to do for you in this speech today. Firstly, I'm going to look at the mechanisms that they gave us as to why less people become vegan at our side, and then I'm going to prove to you that actually more people become vegan on our side. So let's look at the closest they got to proving that less things get worse on our side. The first thing they told us was that it becomes trivialized, which turns people off. It is unclear why this would turn people off. The only people who would be turned off by it being presented as trivial is hardcore vegans who think that trivialization is unfair to their movement. Those kind of people are so dedicated to their veganism, they're not just going to stop. 
That means that they weren't able to prove that the general public who weren't already vegan would be turned off by the idea that it was trivialised. Because fundamentally what trivialisation means is that it seems easier, that it seems more simple, which are all the kind of things that make people more likely to become vegan that we prove to you down the line. Secondly, they tell us that, they get, that we get more media weaponisation. But they never proved this. It's, we explained to you at third that the extreme me media are symmetric. It is worse on their side, given that we've proved that the movement itself is more extreme, so there is more room for media to weaponise it. Thirdly, they've told us that they would get proactive growth of veganism because a critical mass already exists. Not that if they do prove that a critical mass already exists, all that proves is that a mass that existed before this motion is being debated continues to be vegan. So they don't actually get any benefit there, they just get that some people were vegan. But what actually true is that this debate is about regretting the depiction of veganism as trendy. And it is that depiction, as I explained to you at second, that allowed it to generate a critical mass by tying it to other movements or other things that already had support. Fourthly, they tell us that, you, that, that they would get this result of veganism being promoted by just promoting its benefits on their own. The first thing to note is that when you just promote the benefits of veganism on its own, it is much less engaging. We have explained to you down the line as when you promote it as aesthetic, as tying it to cultural foods, as making the video by content creators you already trust, you are more likely to get by in because the content is more engaging. But also, we proved to you down the line that on their side of the house they just get less content about veganism being made. Because many media groups, as I pointed out, only report on things that are seen as trendy, which means that those groups aren't reporting on veganism on their side and are reporting on the alternative trends we told you would develop at first, like ketoism. So, they have not been able to prove any benefit on this matter of buy-in or any substantial harm to us. Let's look at why we actually get increased buy-in. They try to decrease the amount of increased buy-in we get by saying that this trend only lasts a short time. The first thing to note is that that's still normalises it, which means we're still able to claim all the benefits they tried and 